Let us pray. Let us pray. Testify to us, O God, by the voice of your Spirit. Put your law in our hearts. Write your word in our minds. And show us your will in our lives. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from the book of Psalms, number 150, under the heading of Praise for God's Universal Glory. It's the last of all the Psalms. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him, praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his surpassing greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with clanging cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. But everything that breathes, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. So just to keep everyone on their toes, the time with all ages is incorporated into our epistle reading. So you can be ready. Uh, the end of the reading and that prayer will be you know, to share the shepherd mentally. <clears throat> so it looks like we've got mail. I don't know. Can you read it that far away? Can we zoom in a little bit on the pulpit? I'm sorry, I've given our, our tech folks a challenge. I wrote it in Sharpie so you could see it. Or it was written in Sharpie. <laughs> to churches in Galatia and churches in Central Virginia. And who is that? That's us. Okay. So we have mail. And in ancient times, you all know this, there was no post office, I think. Is the United States and Ben Franklin, are we the ones that invented the post office? I think we might be. Uh, so, no, we're not. Okay, I see our uh, British citizen, dual citizen, shaking in her head. Anyway, uh, there was no post office, so people who wanted to communicate with each other, either in what's called literary, very important documents that would be revised, or simply, hey, come back home, you're needed, uh, whatever, those kind of letters, uh, they would write things out, or if they couldn't read and write, they would dictate it to a scribe, and that person would write it out, and then they'd give that letter to a trusted friend who may be already on their way to wherever the letter needed to go. So that's the case for this kind of letter, the letter to the churches in Galatia and us in Central Virginia. So uh, it would only be someone that they really trusted because you couldn't really guarantee that it would make it. And it would probably be weeks, if not months, before you might hear back from someone. And again, this is almost 2,000 years ago. So the people who received, especially the literary letters, uh, would read them over and over. Uh, and the case would be in worship for those new churches that were starting up. Um, especially these are our earliest documents. The epistles in the Bible are our earliest Christian documents. So they would read them over and over. They would take very good care of them. And the person who wrote, especially those literary ones, would usually make a copy uh, for themselves. And that's why we have so many letters in the New Testament. So here's this letter to the churches in Galatia. So let's open it, shall we? Shall we read this? Hope you like Mr. Rogers. Can we do that? Okay. Um, so I'm going to read the beginning of the letter. That's not our scripture reading today, but I'm going to read the beginning of the letter to give us a sense of this really is we're reading someone else's mail, uh, but it's mail intended to be shared broadly. So the beginning of uh, the letter to the Galatians says, Paul, an apostle, sent neither by human commission nor from human authorities, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, 
and all the members of God's family who are with me, to the churches of Galatia and Central Virginia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins and to set us free from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Isn't that a nice community? And then immediately after this, here's what he writes. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who are confusing you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should proclaim to you a gospel contrary to what we proclaim to you, let that be one accursed. As we have said before, so now I repeat, if anyone proclaims to you a gospel contrary to what you received, let that one be accursed. Okay, so the letter takes a big turn in that very beginning, that first chapter, what we call the first chapter. Uh, but Paul goes through all kinds of wonderful arguments and uh, continues to exhort and chastise them, but also gives them uh, support. And then the letter at the end, just like we might uh, sign a birthday card to someone, lots of love, me, uh, this is the way at the end of the letter, which we call chapter 5, verse 18, says, May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. Amen. So here we are, we're reading someone else's mail, but it was mail that was intended to be circulated, and it was. It was passed between those churches in Galatia and read over and over. So we come to our reading today, which comes later in the uh, letter to the churches in Galatia. And this is chapter 3, verses 23 through 29. And one of these verses happens to be my one of my favorites in the whole now, before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God, through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. And my favorite, 28. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one. In Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham, Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us pray. Thank you, God, for letters from the early church that help us understand how to follow Jesus, how to love one another and how to share your love in the world. Amen. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable before you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I have spent years uh, in my ministry, here and elsewhere, using the phrase, all are welcome. Now, it could read or be said, uh, you are welcome, but the phrase, all are welcome, not only greets the person who's reading it or hearing it, but it also emphasizes that everyone is welcome. You are welcome, they are welcome, all are welcome. Now, as wonderful as being welcome is, something else was brought to my attention, gosh, 
maybe about two or three years ago by, a, by some fellow Presbyterians. And that is the idea of not only welcoming, but the sense of belonging. So being welcome is great. I think we all feel that. But who doesn't, and who doesn't love feeling welcome, especially if you are a guest visiting someplace for the first time, it's really nice to feel welcome. But welcome also kind of implies, not necessarily, but it kind of implies that someone is doing the welcoming and someone is being welcomed. So the we are welcoming and the they are being welcomed or them. We welcome them. So belonging goes quite a bit further. Belonging says that there is no division between us, some sense of us, and them. We and they, or even you and me. Belonging reminds us that everyone, everyone belongs. All belong. Now, this morning, I didn't mention it in announcements, but it's wonderful that today we are receiving three new members of the congregation. And I'm so glad you all were able to make it this morning. Uh, they want to make their connection with South Plains congregation official, formal. Uh, and we are so happy that that is the case. And they are transferring from two congregations, one of which sadly had to close and another of which is just a little too far away now uh, after a move. So at the same time, there are, as you know, some folks connected to this congregation. We call them friends. They worship very regularly here and they probably support the ministry and mission through their time, talents, and treasure. And uh, they belong to so whether or not they make their membership formal, they belong as well. Belonging is a gift from God. So today's epistle lesson from uh, Galatians is one of Paul's most beautiful statements on our connection to Christ, on our sense of belonging. The divisions that we often create based on culture, language, skin color, and nationality are shattered by God's action in Christ. In the first century of Christianity, a major controversy for the early church, you probably know this, was whether a follower of Jesus must first become Jewish. In other words, if they weren't Jewish from birth, in order to become a follower of Jesus, should they be made to follow all the laws of Judaism and then become a Christian? So this was a matter of great importance for the early church. And in this passage from Galatians, Paul once again reassures a Gentile audience. He wrote this for people who did not primarily grow up as Jews. He reassures them that they too are heirs according to the promise. That's e H-E-I-R-S, along with the children of Israel. In verse 28, again, one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible, Paul writes, there is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Like so many powerful teachings by Jesus and by others in the Bible, this verse is a wonderful ideal. But it can be very difficult to live out in our day-to-day -day lives. Our lives in the church, and especially and in society and in a global culture where we are so much more aware of how many different kinds of practices and peoples there are around the world than our brothers and sisters 2,000 years ago. One minister asks a challenging question, as well as offering um, eye-opening observations. And she writes, are we willing to stake our mission 
and church membership policies on Galatians, especially chapter 3, verse 28. Answering yes to this question drives hard against our stubborn self-centeredness. It's difficult for most American congregations to grapple with the truth that the gospel, the gospel does not begin with us. When choosing churches, we have too long sought the reassurance of similarity rather than the evidence of the Spirit's presence. The most profound differences between people known to Paul, like the differences between people known to us, are nothing compared to the power of Christ to reconcile all things. Christ, who has with God made one body out of an infinitely varied tapestry of believers. Where is the church that lives out this vision? Where is the denomination that has not compromised its soul with a complacent disregard of this energetic word? For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. In a book called What's Wrong with the World, G.K. Chesterton wrote, the Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. End quote. Wow, this is a big challenge to us all in any congregation, whether here or in a big city. Um, if we see God's work in Christ as being for all of creation, the challenge can even go beyond the bounds of what we call church. Of course, Paul talks about baptism, which is hugely important. But in some senses, if Christ is for all, uh, some of those boundaries, even those, dissolve. And even religious differences are not the barrier that we sometimes see them to be. The power of Christ is even greater than the divisions of religious belief and practice. Again, that's the ideal, a lot harder in the details. God's grace and power are beyond the boxes that we try to place to keep God's love to ourselves. And I speak this about myself, not just an accuse, accusation for others. We still often disagree with one another in the church, with other people of faith, and with people of no faith about what God is calling people to do and to be. Nevertheless, we can at the same time recognize that all people are children of God. Even people whose actions or beliefs cause us to grumble or rage. We don't have to agree to love and to recognize that people are children of God. Even our enemies are children of God and cannot be treated as subhuman. Everyone, no matter how different or broken, everyone belongs through the God, through the grace of God in Christ. All are one in Christ Jesus. Now, the late Bishop Desmond Tutu, who died the day after Christmas last December, he knew quite a bit about division and people being treated as subhuman. As an Anglican priest in South Africa, Tutu saw the ravages of apartheid oppression of black and brown South Africans. Because of his tireless advocacy for justice in South Africa, Bishop Tutu was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1984. A decade later, when apartheid had finally been abolished in South Africa, new President Nelson Mandela appointed Desmond Tutu to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, tasked with investigating and reporting on the atrocities committed by both sides in the struggle over apartheid. Forgiveness and reconciliation, as well as the pursuit of justice, still characterized Tutu's work until his death. If you have ever had the chance, and there's plenty on, on, uh, on the internet, if you've had a chance to hear the bishop speak, you know that he is charming and he's warm-hearted and joyful. All this after the pain that he has witnessed and experienced himself and amidst his hard work for justice. 
In 2008, he released a lovely children's book entitled God's Dream. I think I might have read it early on uh, when we were still only on Zoom for the time with all ages. Somehow, Tutu is able to share the message about all people belonging. He does that in religious language that somehow unites rather than divides. Now, again, I may have read this before, but if you're like me, repetition is the key to learning. So I will have a copy of it in fellowship time if you want to take a look at the beautiful artwork. But I thought I would share, it only takes about three minutes, I would just read the words to this lovely book that's ch a children's book, but it speaks great truth. So this is uh, Desmond Tutu's God's Dream. Dear child of God, what do you dream about in your loveliest dreams? Do you dream about flying high or rainbows reaching across the sky? Do you dream about being free to do what your heart desires? Or about being treated like a full person, no matter how young you might be? Do you know what God dreams about? If you close your eyes and look with your heart, I'm sure, dear child, that you will find out. God dreams about people sharing. God dreams about people caring. God dreams that we reach out and hold one another's hand and play one another's games, laugh with one another's hearts. But God does not force us to be friends or to love one another. Dear child of God, it does happen that we get angry and hurt one another. Soon we start to feel sad and very alone. Sometimes we cry and God cries with us. But when we say we're sorry and forgive one another, we wipe away our tears and God's tears too. Each of us carries a piece of God's heart within us. And when we love one another, the pieces of God's heart are made whole. God dreams that every one of us will see that we are all brothers and sisters. Yes, even you and me, even if we have different mommies and daddies or live in different faraway lands, even if we speak different languages or have different ways of talking to God. Even if we have different eyes or different skin, even if you are taller and I am smaller, even if your nose is little and mine is large. Dear child of God, do you know how to make God's dream come true? It's really quite easy. As easy as sharing, loving, caring, as easy as holding, playing, laughing as easy as knowing we are family because we are all God's children. Will you help God's dream come true? Let me tell you a secret. God smiles like a rainbow when you do. In the grace of the universal Christ, you belong. They belong. We all belong. We go beyond welcome and we see that all belong. We are all children of God equipped to help God's dream come true. Hallelujah. Amen. Will you